welcome to this great conversation with the Oregon Department of Education on discussing menstrual dignity beyond the bill, inclusive implementation in public schools. We all know that passing bills is one thing, it's very exciting, but we also wanna discuss how it actually looks like once the bill's passed. And so we are here today with staff from the Oregon Department of Education, Sasha Grenier, the Sexuality and Education Specialist, and Denise Elijah, the Menstrual Dignity Act Analyst, so they can share with us about their experience on how to, um, how they're implementing this bill in Oregon. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'd love for you both to first introduce yourselves, your pronouns, um, and your role. Yeah, um, I, I'm Sasha Grenier. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the sexuality education specialist at ODE, and my role is to support school districts implementing comprehensive sexuality education, as well as menstrual dignity programs, pregnant and parenting team programs, and child abuse prevention programs. And I'm Danny Elijah, and I'm the Menstrual Dignity Act Analyst. My program, my pronouns are she and her, and my role is really centered in on the Menstrual Dignity Act. So the components of education, implementation, um, and support, uh, et cetera, everything that has to do with supporting this program. Awesome. Thank you both for joining us today. So I'd love to start off by having you tell us a little bit about Oregon's Menstrual Dignity Act of 2021. What are the requirements of this bill and what does this mean for students who menstruate throughout Oregon? Yeah, so the Oregon legislature passed HB 3294 in 2021, and that required that school districts provide menstrual products in all bathrooms in all public school buildings. Oregon's law is the most inclusive of its kind in the country, and it's been doing, um, it's been really impacting students for the better throughout the state. Schools are now stocking pads and tampons in bathrooms, as well as providing classroom education on menstrual health, all in accessible and inclusive ways that help young people take care of their bodies, learn, um, and really understand menstruation and their health in ways that are positive and not shameful or stigmatizing. Um, we know as, as well as students from across the country, students in Oregon are affected by period poverty, and we know that it can prevent young people from engaging in school. Um, whether that means not going to school entirely because they have their period or because they don't have access to menstrual products and they have to leave home early. Um, so providing menstrual products is a basic service to support young people access their education. Um, we know that young people need to understand their bodies and make sure that they don't feel ashamed, ashamed or embarrassed about the natural parts of their development. Excellent, thank you so much. Now, this bill was signed into law last year in May 2021, correct? Um, and so how has this bill come to life in Oregon schools? Once the bill passed, what does that look like now um, as you're starting to implement this? So we've heard from many educators and students as they've begun stocking their products and, and it's coming to life. And we're really hearing a lot of them feeling supported. They're supported and really glad to be able to meet their needs and preserve their dignity in that way. One of our schools uh, in Fall City School District, it's a rural district, and there we've seen a partnership with educators and community partners and the students, um, and they all came together and worked to provide education that destigmatized menstruation by having pizza parties. And the way that they were providing products is they would have big cabinets and they would have lots of choices and options and signage that was encouraging um encouraging and yet not like you know it was encouraging and not not something that made it feel like it's something weird or gross but come have some have what you need take what you need take care of your body um and we also are hopeful because one of the statistics that we really look to as a shining light is when schools in new york city had a similar program, they saw a 2.4% 2 2 increase in attendance. And so we've struggled, we know Oregon struggled with, uh, as the rest of this, the country in recovering after the pandemic. And so we're really hoping this can be something that can boost our attendance as well in that same way. Um, and the other thing we're really hoping, just like the school in Fall City or that district did, is that the program will continue to destigmatize the topic of menstrual health. We know that talking about menstruation with people of all ages, all genders, as just a healthy part of growing up and being a human um, and reducing the shame and stigma that students feel about getting their period is really, really important. And we want to 
we want that to be highlighted also as part of creating a more welcoming school culture where menstruation is just understood as part of human development. Great, thank you so much for sharing. And so, I mean, being part of the Oregon Department of Education, can you talk about how ODE has played, like the role that ODE has played with ensuring compliance of this new policy? It's one thing to pass a bill, but then how has this state agency supported schools with making sure that this is actually something that's coming to life? Yeah, thank you for that. And what's important to note is that the legislature first passed this bill and kind of tasked or the Oregon Department of Education um, as well as the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, who does higher ed, um, with implementing the program. So it's really been our charge uh, at the department um, to make sure that school districts um, know about their requirements and that they have what they need to make it happen. Um, and so that's been our, our job for the last year and a half more at this point. Um, and so what we did is that we pulled together the um, Menstrual Dignity for Students Toolkit, which is kind of our one-stop shop that has requirements and recommendations for all that will make the program work um, for students. Um, it centers student equity and menstrual dignity. Um, it has components related to education and privacy um, and really um, helps with best practices for things like staff engagement, um, student and community engagement, as well as resources for provi providing menstrual health education that is positive, like we said before, and celebratory and not fear or shame based. Um, we also require that school districts uh, submit a reimbursement form to us to report how they are using their products or their funds to buy products and dispensers um, and to assert compliance with the program. Um, so first and foremost, our role at the department is to really provide that technical support um, to make sure that they have what they need and they understand the importance of the program. Um, they know where to access resources and information. Um, and then secondary, you know, we also provide, um, you know, funding for the program goes through us. Uh, so we make sure that they have, um, you know, we have a compliance and reporting accountability for transparency sake with, with the funding of the program. We know where it's going um, and what it's being used for. Well, that's great to hear. I'd love to hear more about this Oregon's Menstrual Dignity uh, Student Toolkit. There are a few toolkits like this available, but often they exist um, or are led by menstrual equity advocacy groups or coalitions in the state. Frankly, they're still kind of in process of being developing. It's not the norm. We see bills passed, but we don't see toolkits like this done. So I'd love to hear more about what led the Oregon Department of Education to create this toolkit and how have schools responded to it? Well, one big thing that pushed us to create this toolkit was because we received questions about implementing the new laws. When we have laws like this, particularly uh, regarding education, regarding um, things that some things that are quite technical, uh, those questions are going to arise. And so we wanted to be able to provide the best tips that we've heard from schools that are already implementing the program, as well as from some of those uh, advocate groups around the country even. Um, we have lots and lots of links in the toolkit that brings together what we've seen as options that schools can choose from when figuring out how they want to implement the program. And students as well that have used the program uh, or used um, have benefited from using products um, part that the program distributed, as well as we even have resources from educators like slideshows, things like that, that they've used. And we included all of that so that schools around the state can benefit from those resources. And we really find that our schools have benefited from that because we've heard back from them that they appreciate being able to know what products, what some of the products op options could be, um, how to how to place dispensers or what to do about field trips, things like that, where to find lessons, how do we get our money? Um, we want those questions to be answered easily and in one place so that if they want to find additional resources, they can, but they don't have to. They can find everything they need to do to implement the program in one place. Well, I'd love to hear more about the process of creating this toolkit. Um, for maybe other advocates or coalitions or groups or other state agencies that might be interested in creating something similar for their bill, um, for their menstrual dignity bills. Uh, I'd love to hear maybe what has worked out well with this toolkit and also what was maybe more difficult than you expected um, in the creation or implementation of this, of this bill. 
Yeah, so as Denise mentioned, you know, this program is completely new. And for many districts uh, or many schools, they had been providing menstrual products for a long time um, to their students. But for many, this was a completely new thinking about uh, menstruation and menstrual products uh, was kind of a whole new ballpark for them. Um, so they really needed some clarification, some support and resources um, in regards to how local implementation looks. Um, especially in regards to some of these things that we know are so important to menstrual dignity, like privacy, inclusivity, education, and access. Um, some of these ways to consider and think about uh, the program, we really needed to highlight and to make sure student uh, districts were thinking about all of that when providing the, the products. Um, we convened over 40 different partners and, and individuals and organizations um, from across the state, including young people, including youth sexual health experts, uh, including educators, um, school board members, uh, you name it, were at the table. Uh, representatives from the Oregon Health Authority, uh, the Office of Indian Education. Uh, we really brought together, um, you know, we, what we think was a pretty uh, was a pretty comprehensive group of folks. Um, and so they were really integral to making sure that this tool met the needs of, of everyone that the legislation intended to reach. Um, so we included them. We met several different times. Um, we you know, really tried to get the perspective of people on the ground implementing the program, right? We met with facilities managers and other people. Um, so we you know, were able to put all of that into the toolkit. Um, you know, I think some of our challenges in implementing the program um, have been, you know, just making sure people get the information that they need. Like, this, again, like this is a whole new program. Um, so what does this really look like? And what do you have to think about, right? I mean, you have to think about so many different things when it comes to menstrual health, uh, such as privacy, inclusivity, like I mentioned before. Um, you know, because privacy, for instance, is one of our foremost guiding principles, we really wanted to support school districts in, in thinking about what that looked like, as opposed to kind of traditionally, I think many of us uh, had menstrual products available with just the nurse, right? And although that's great, we really wanted people to think about placement within bathrooms, what information they're getting within the bathrooms to use products safely, um, and that suit their needs and cultural context. So all of these considerations um, you know, it's it, this will work best when districts think about all those things and how do they engage students and um, and so really I think our challenges have just been, you know, good challenges in the sense that we're just like explaining the components of the law and how to walk through thinking about them in their lo own local context and how it looks differently from one bathroom in one school to another bathroom in another school. Um, and that's okay and that's great. Um, and so really just talking about that and, and talking to you about, um, we've done a lot, of, a lot of clarification about um, how do we support all students in terms of having them in all bathrooms, right? So that all, all of our students, especially our transgender, non-binary and intersex students, um, you know, have access to their education and essential healthcare services um, in the same way that, that, that their peers have access to. Um, so really explaining a lot of these aspects um, is, is where most of our work has, has fallen. And well, you mentioned that, I mean, the fact that most, or it sounds like all the schools are working on implementing these products. So does that mean that all schools and organs have product dispensers? Um, like they're, that's expensive. Do they have that in like the fancy product dispensers in every single bathroom in all the organ schools? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, so the original statute uses the word dispenser, um, but what we've done with our Oregon administrative rules and with our toolkit, um, we've clarified that in some bathrooms that might not make sense, right? Like having a big metallic wall unit in a second grade single stall bathroom might not make the most sense. So we've clarified and expanded that to include really anything where products can fit um, such as baskets or Tupperware bins or, you know, whatever makes sense for that bathroom. And it makes sense for student use, how many students are using that bathroom, um, even an envelope on the wall for bathrooms that don't, uh, aren't frequented regularly by menstruating students. Um, so we've really left it up to local control to decide what makes sense for them and the students that need them. 
Thank you. That helps clarify. And that makes total sense because you've got some people that may have small boxes or cute little, um, I've seen those in some schools where they have little, um, I can't think of the word, but there's little little periods, little period pecs there. And it's really nice to have that as an option for folks. Um, I've certainly been found in spaces without a period uh, or a pad sometimes or a tampon. Um, all right. Well, fast forward to 2022, like, so when we're recording this, it's a year after this, you know, a little bit of over a year after the bill has been signed and it's been implemented this school year. Um, how did this toolkit that OD created um, get distributed into the hands of schools and advocates that need it most? Um, what well, was that distribution like and how do people have access to it now? Yes, uh, is the short answer. They have access to it. Um, we've been sharing it in our newsletter. It's available on our website um, within things around the sexuality education that we're doing within our state and also uh, in a few different kinds of communication and listservs from ODE. And we also have a sexual sexuality education newsletter and menstrual dignity newsletter. Um, both of those keep folks updated, whether they're local or not, um, that want to be updated on some of the, the things regarding those two programs within our state and also just kind of topical things um, around those subjects within our state. We've also um, presented at conferences and things like that to make sure like school board, uh, school district leaders and others kind of know about the toolkit. Um, so we've been kind of going on a little bit of a, a you know, presentation roadshow, except uh, much uh, on a lower scale, smaller scale than that, but getting the word out. Great. And since you've launched this um, just even in the last year, do you have any updates or amendments that you're expecting to have with this toolkit moving forward? We have quite a few just in the next month uh, that are going to happen. Um, we have some updates as far as the permanent rules now being, uh, being there as opposed to the temporary rules. And that's going to be taking effect. It is taking effect this school year. Um, there's requirements and recommendations related to um, the Senate Bill 1522 that have that have happened and that have been. Um, they're really going to be beneficial and are beneficial as far as situations where students um, are somewhere where the bathroom is not controlled by the school district. Making sure that students still have access to products, um, and then also we have a lot of schools in our state that are. Um, learning at home. A lot of students are learning at home, whether it's through a virtual charter, whether it's through a state a district sponsored program. And so we have some recommendations for those schools that really our, our schools, our local schools have taken the lead in, um, in offering us things that we can then offer to other schools as recommendations for how to do that. Uh, we really had a lot of questions about K2. And so we've Ad added additional resources and guidance for K2, as well as 3-5 implementation. Um, what should it look like? We know that um, if kids are menstruating as early as eight, there could be a second grader, right? So we have to think about what those resources should look like. And then also um, providing guidance on selecting instructions for tampons and pads, as well as um, offering options that folks can use to modify or to use outright, but really to have the guidance to know what's required, what's required by the FDA, for one thing, um, in, in offering products and making sure that products can be used safely. And also lots of updated resources and links, updated um, and lessons also that um, we've gotten access to that we're providing for folks to use if they'd like. That's awesome. Well, if people do want to connect with uh, ODE to learn more about the Menstrual Dignity Act implementation, how can they learn more, especially as you're getting updates? Um, yeah, what's the best way for them to connect or learn more? Well, um, we could start by going to the uh, to our website, um, our ODE website um, on sexuality education. Um, on that website, we have a section for Menstrual Dignity for Students program resources. Um, we also, there's also a website uh, called uh, the Oregon Open Learning Hub. That's a place where there are openly licensed free resources for sexuality education. Um, and we are, we're putting more and more resources related to menstrual dignity, um, mostly lessons and also other educator tools will be there um, and are there already um, and, and growing in the next several weeks and months. Um, so those two websites, I think, are great places to start. Um, on our website, too, you can have, um, you can sign up for our listserv or reach out to us. Our email address is also there. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for those that are listening in. Um, my name is Damaris Pereda. I use your pronouns and I'm the National Programs Director at Period. We thank you all for joining in this important conversation and all of the links and resources that our team shared here, um, they are going to be located on periodactionday.com. And so this important conversation with the Oregon Department of Education is an incredible resource that we hope that you can share and use in your networks to ensure that all the bills that pass are actually beyond the bill and they actually get to schools and students who need it the most, like um, the example that Oregon is working on and excited to lead the way. Um, again, check out periodaction.com to learn more and check out the resources, but thank you all for joining us and thank you, Sasha and Denise. Thank you. Thanks.